In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we answer fitness and health questions asked by listeners just like you, okay? But the way we open this episode is with our introductory portion where we talk about our lives, we mention studies, we talk about what's going on in the world, sometimes we talk about our sponsors. So let me give you a rundown of this entire episode. We start out by talking about uh, the workout we had uh, together. We don't do this very often, but it's real enjoyable. Doug consistently beats us up yeah. in the workout. He gets angry. It's pretty annoying. Then we talked about the stock market. Doesn't make sense. Why does it keep going up when everything's going crazy? No idea. Uh, gun sales are through the roof. Shocking. No, Lots of uncertainty. That's happening. Then we talked about pregnancy and parenting. Uh, as many of you know, I am expecting uh, a baby coming along. So that's exciting. So I got to talk about that. And we talked about uh, parenting because we all value being fathers really well. We're not the best fathers. We mess up all the time, but we try to do our best. Yeah. Then we talked about Magic Spoon cereal. They made some changes to make it taste even better. Mm -hmm. Now, Magic Spoon cereal is high in protein and it has no sugar. I know that sounds crazy, but it's totally true. It's whey protein, too. It's not even crappy protein. It's whey protein. Now, we work with this company, so we have a hook out, hook up excuse me, for you. We're going to hook up. Yeah. Just go to magicspoon.com forward slash mind pump. You automatically get a discount. Um, or you can go to the normal website and use the code Mind Pump. Uh, check out the fruity flavor one and blueberry. Those are the ones that Justin eats all the time. Yeah. Watch out, Chris Jericho. Then I talked about how UCLA is getting funding to study terpenes. These are the things in cannabis and other fruits and vegetables that give them their smell. They actually have effects in the body, which is kind of interesting. Then I talked about how uh, a meme meant to inflame emotion actually tricked me. Um, and we talked about good versus bad people, and this is uh, something that I think is very important to talk about with today's uh, or, or, or these days events that are going on right now. Then we got into the question. So here's what we answered today. The first person says, I struggle to put weight on my squat. I'm long, lanky. I'm at 300 pounds, can't go up. What can I do? So we talk all about getting squat numbers to improve. The next question, this person's used to working out with lots of machines and cables and stuff like that, but because the gyms are all closed or they're not open the way they used to, now they're stuck with a squat rack, barbell, and dumbbells and want to know if that's good enough. Yeah. Um, well, and here's a short answer. Not only is it good enough, it's better, but we break it down in that part of the episode. The next question, this person wants to know what the difference is between a false grip or a standard grip while bench pressing or overhead pressing. So one of them, your thumb is under the bar. The other one, the thumb is over the bar. And yes, there are benefits to each. And the final question, this person, True, wants, false. This person wants to know what our best tips are for gut health. Uh, so we talk all about that. Um, also, this month, one of our most popular fat-burning programs ever, MAPS HIT, is 50% off. Now, HIT stands for High Intensity Interval Training. This program is designed specifically to produce fast results in a shorter period of time. It's a short program. It's about six weeks long. It's intense. The workouts are short, but it does burn a ton of calories. It is a phenomenal fat-burning program. It's very popular. You don't need a lot of equipment. In fact, most people with basic home gym equipment will be able to do the whole program no problem. Again, it's 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapshit.com, that's M-A-P-S-H-I-I-T.com, and then use the code HIT50, that's H-I-I-T-5-0. There is no space. Do that for the discount. Yeah, I got something for you. Oh, for me? Whoa, I whoa, just whoa, hijacked. Whoa. Oh my God, I'm excited. Sal is so excited. He Why was my voice do that? I just hijacked so, you on that one. What happened? So uh, Oklahoma uh, Judge awards Carol Baskin with... Uh, uh, Joe Exotic's uh, Zoo. Oh, that, Dude, that, bitch, Carol, Carol that bitch Carol Baskin wins again. He's never going to survive never. financially after this. Never going to recover <laughs> financially from this. <laughs> did you see the never. meme? Did you see the meme going around? What did it say? It said, uh, "Who would have thought uh, um, Tiger King was the most normal thing in 2020?" Dude. Oh my, yeah, right. Oh, that's so perfect. Dude. I learned a lot of things from watching that. For example, <laughs> hmm. all it takes is 
meth to, yeah. t- to turn a straight man gay, apparently. That's yeah. all it takes to get him to do. <laughs> meth and tigers, Me- bro. Oh, sorry, and tigers. Yeah, yeah. you forget the biggest I component. Guess, meth yeah. and tigers, and you're, you're- tigers may be more well, alluring than the meth, dude. Okay, uh, so there was another thing, too, about this, right? So the sheriff uh, from whatever county it was that uh, she's from was talking about, like, the will, how it was obviously, uh, like, totally what, what's the word for that not forged but uh, fabricated, uh, fabricated. Mm. yeah like and so they're they're looking into that as well meanwhile Dude. she just got that uh awarded to her uh, what a sting what a what a what a salt on well, the wounds for joe exotic she won a bunch of money from him and he couldn't pay her right so that's yeah. probably what happened that was the well. last thing he wanted to happen was his zoo go to her Dude, i, I didn't understand it either he like he has tigers in captivity yeah and she has tigers, tigers yeah in captivity yeah, I, there's I literally no difference. How is she saving them? Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> he, he played with the little tiger yeah. cubs. That was the difference. Dude, I think. speaking of animals, um, you, you go to, you guys have been to parks, right? Parks and neighborhoods or whatever. And you, no, you go, you I avoid them like crazy. Good. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since they passed that law against you, yeah, just that law within yeah. <laughs> two miles of parks. We yeah, won't or, talk about that. Or schools, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Legally, I'm not allowed to talk about that. Yeah, either, no. Okay. No, but um, the most aggressive animal by far uh, at a park is a uh, or Squirrel. geese. Oh no! Geese. Oh yeah, geese. Oh yeah, they're oh, assholes. My God, man, dude, they are territorial. Dude, one of them tried to yeah bite uh, one of my kids when I was at Roaring Camp. Did you camp. see the barstool video of the the old white guy that was walking some geese? Yeah, and it was just flying. Yeah, <laughs> it makes across sense. the street. They're frightening. Hilarious. Dude, so for me, this is how I listen. I wouldn't actually do this, okay? But I'm when I'm at the park and we go to the like the lake area, and then the geese comes up and starts posturing. I'm just thinking in my head like, come on, bro. Yeah, yeah, I dare you. Yeah, bring it. I did. You, I did jujitsu, and you're pretty much all neck. So I'm pretty sure I can choke you <laughs> pretty easily. Hey, turkeys that. do that too, man. Like we've had, we have a lot, a big turkey uh, uh, flock or whatever the fuck you call it. But <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the term is. A, a murder. It's of, called a gobble. It's a murder of fucking turkeys. No, but, no, it's a gobble. A gobble. No, I just made that you, up. No, <laughs> I, I didn't believe you at all. They're flocks, aren't but they? But yeah, anyways, they, they're flocks. They won't get out of the road. They like they, they try and like they hiss. <laughs> I'm like, what is this? How do they do it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird, gross <laughs> sound. Like a and dragon. I'm, yeah. Like, geese, dude. yeah. What do you guys- and I'm like, listen, you're like Thanksgiving dinner. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, dude. You know, like with, with the balls of these things. Bro, I was driving with my son. I was, I took, I was taking my son home from school <clears throat> and- out of nowhere. Like, we're just cruising. I'm not even going fast. I'm going like 35, maybe, cruising. And a bird just flies down, and it hits my bumper and bounces off and flies away just for no reason. It's like, flew from up here, <laughs> flies out, boom, and goes up. And my son looks at me yeah. like, what the fuck just happened? Yeah. You know? He didn't say that because I would have... Oh, that trouble. happens all the time. If you have like a really big window, like birds just like suicide but this is my car and i'm yeah. driving and so i'm like my son and i are coming up with reasons for it and i'm and so he says he says i wonder if he was showing off to his friends you know yeah. what i mean i wonder if him and the birds were up there <laughs> he's like, i dare you to go down this i'll do it bro i don't care yeah. i dare you and he's like fly poof, comes do you up triple and, dog dare me yeah and everybody's like yeah yeah you're a badass anyway it's, dude it's i had pro- a great probably what happened had another great workout with you we, ha- we haven't done enough workouts together it was really good <sighs> Yeah, I mean, it's probably number five at this point, right? It was. You know what I keep learning, though, from these uh, workouts we do together, now that we've done at least five of them? Yes. Doug, by far, applies the highest intensity. Yeah. By far. Yeah. All of us seem like we're trying to protect. Well, he, he has a lot of rage still in there. <laughs> yeah. You notice that? Yeah. I feel like he, he, has, he, like, he, feels, he feels like he has something to prove. You know what I'm saying? Dude, ah! a, bunch of tra- a bunch of trainer buddies. You know what I'm saying? He's yeah. got to be like, he can't go into the workout weeks. It's been so. proven, Doug. Yeah. He, you see, he slams doing. those weights. Yeah, yeah. You don't uh, have to do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. I'm oh. just serious about what I do. I know, but I, I, <laughs> always look at him hey it ain't that serious guy oh, you know? it's man. ain't that serious this is like a vacation workout for all, me all of us are like you know each one of us is like uh, every day is serious my, <laughs> my knee uh, my hip a little bit oh, i got a headache you know, I know. Stretch, oh, you know <laughs> like, veins, uh, that's enough veins you coming know? out of his yeah. neck yeah. by the way he looks the best i know by far still, still at it doug you do look like you've put on a little bit of of lean mass though no, is it? Are, are you? What's? What are you doing? Are you different? flirting with Doug right now? No, 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 no. This is what happening. am I doing? Yeah, what's different? Uh, d- consistency, really, for mm. me, is just going regularly on my my workouts. Uh, I've been doing Maps Anabolic. I'm in phase two now. Mm. You love that program. I love it. You always circle yeah. back to that one. Yeah. Like I said in one of my posts, I've done it probably over fifteen times. 
Doug's one of the Dang. first people to follow Maps Anabolic. He was one of the testers. I'd like to think I was I was the first person. Yeah, well, you, <laughs> I am Maps Anabolic. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty much just, Patient Zero. Yeah. It's pretty much my idea. Actually. That's how I named it. By the way, yeah. I was like, I liked Maps. I came up with the acronym, right? Muscular Adaptation Programming System. I was like, this is perfect. Yeah. I need something else. Doug obviously looks anabolic, oh, yeah. so I put the anabolic. At the end. Hey, yeah. I wanted to ask you, since you're the guy who follows the stocks all the time, what do you think is going on right now with this stock market? Doesn't make any sense. It Isn't makes, it weird? It it's no still sense. up, huh? You got well, it's like hitting record highs. Bro, you got what in you, the hell. You got coronavirus, then you have record unemployment, business to shut down, then you get all this other craziness that's oh, going on. Rioting and yeah, hell on earth. And the market is just bing, bing, bing. Keeps weird. Up. I, I, I don't get it. it. Weird. It, that's so I have a lot of family and friends that are this is what they do for a living, right? They do investments. And they're all like, dude, take your money out. This is weird. Doesn't make any sense. Something's going to happen. The bottom's going to fall out. And they're even saying this. Well, wasn't it you who, who, I think you said this on the podcast, that Warren Buffett is like- He's 45% liquid. 45% liquid right now? Yeah. Which, I would, that's the most I've ever heard him liquid before. Yeah, so, so that means he's, he he thinks that the market's going to gonna take a crap. So he take out you know took out a lot of his money. He has it in cash. So who's who's getting the most like spikes as of late? Like what, what industries? Zoom? Okay. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Zoom. well, of course. Zoom crushed. You know what else crushed? Recently, gun manufacturers exploded. Oh, everything yeah. is though. But Campbell, that Sue, makes a lot of sense. Freaking, uh, you name it. Johnson & Johnson, like any sort of like- Shampoos and soaps and canned foods, like all that stuff, all tech, like Zoom through the Zoom. I think recorded like a hundred and a hundred and something million over their their quarterly projections. Like the thing is though, like and even and the article I was reading was like that they just know that they can't keep up, keep that pace up. So mm -hmm. I mean, it's got to come back down. Every the stock price right now is based off of what they're doing, and they're not going to keep that rate going. I mm -hmm. don't know, man. I know that the Fed keeps pumping money into into the market, and so I feel like a lot of it is fake. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like temporary. Yeah, like there's going to be a bubble yeah. uh, that's going to burst. But some of the stuff that's makes sense. Worry. Like I said, the gun companies, uh, record sales of guns since COVID. And now, of course, you know, what else, the other stuff that's going on. Yeah, the stat you gave the other day was what? 40% are first time buyers. So, so that's a lot. Yeah, current. St so the statistics I've read so far are that 40%. So, first off, gun sales have exploded. These are the, some of the highest rates we've seen in a long time. And this makes sense. Anytime there's uncertainty, mm -hmm. gun sales go up. Um, or if a Democrat gets elected, uh, that actually drives up uh, uh, gun sales too because people are afraid. People they're gonna, think they're going to take them away. Yeah, or something like that, right? Yeah. So, Gun sales exploding. Obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty going on. But the statistics I saw show that 40%, as much as 40% are new first-time gun owners, and 40% of those owners, so of the new gun owners, 40% are women. Oh, wow. So women are buying guns at uh, at record levels that they haven't seen in a long time. Wow. Yeah, so- Do, so. Either, do either one of your guys' wives have guns? No, uh, I've taken her to the range once, but uh, that's no. We didn't, no, she doesn't have a gun. No, no, no. But uh, I've, we've gone shooting and we passed the test, and we're probably going to end up getting her a firearm. Her dad likes to go and in practice, and so it'd be something fun for them to do together. I also think if you own a gun, you need to be very, very well versed. It makes no sense to have one and then not right. train on a regular basis. But something that she enjoyed a lot, and I'm like, this sounds like a a fun hobby, and I mean, uh, it's it's a it's a for if for anybody who's never done it before, it really is a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to to you know aim at a target, hit it, and work on your aim and operate the thing. It's you know whether you believe in self defense with it or or not, it's actually a pretty fun thing. I went uh, uh, bow um, target shooting the yeah. other day. Have you guys ever done? Oh, that? I've been getting into that a lot actually. Ha really, a compound bow? Yeah, I just ordered a compound bow. I have, I've been doing that with my kids because they have. We have a target kind of set up in our backyard, and this is amidst the whole COVID thing. It's like I'm trying to find like physical things to get you know in my backyard that it's not doesn't take up a lot of space, and so we have like a section of our yard that's just devoted to like BB gun targets and um and bow and arrow awesome. uh, type targets. So I love it because it's. I like that even more because it's it takes a bit of skill and it also it, it feels zen like it, yeah. you really have to like uh, focus uh, completely on uh, the target and and your breath and your body and and your and you're really present in that moment and it's just like I don't know man it's 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 quite an experience I've never done it before so this was my first I mean I've shot them here and there but I've never gone to a, a you know target place or whatever and we went to an outdoor range. 
And uh, my father-in-law has, you know, he, he loves doing it. So he had an extra bow. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one thing he said to me was like, get really good at, at firing the exact same way every time. Yeah. Stance, position, and that'll give you accuracy. I have a hard time seeing you shooting a bow. Why? I don't know. It's, it's an athletic thing. Really? Yeah, sure. Bro, I hit <laughs> targets really well. What are you talking about? It's, it's an athletic Bro, thing Bro, listen. Still. I beat both you guys at horse. Dude, That's if, all target stuff. If his I, hands only have to go in the T-Rex position here and then forward, yeah. he's like a genius. He's yeah. like amazing. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> Anything. First of all, I don't do stuff like that. This to here. Like, this yeah. to this. Yeah. What are you doing? Dude? That's Any, it. Anything that requires the, the lower and the upper. That's what I'm saying. Like together, shoot a basketball, like, listen, throw yeah. a dart, arm wrestling. I beat you guys at horse. It's all the carnival shit i won a car for, off of adam it's just you for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay he was i get hit that, up all that i get bro. hit up on that all the time oh, we're not rich enough I that was the most it. amazing thing i've ever it, you know? he was so cut, cut me some slack. he was so confident too he's like i'll i'll buy you a car like, still to this day like you could do anything i mean you could become president whatever dude but you making that shot was yeah. the most impressive it didn't thing make any sense. do dude how do you prevent do you see my arm right here do you notice a little bit of the discoloration how do you prevent the the string from hitting your forearm? Oh yeah, it's just technique. I, that does happen though. Dude, I mean, like, blasted. they have like yeah, I know they have like stuff. this leather thing you can wear in your arm. That would be funny if you did. If you're a little girl about it, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I take the I take you the see with knee pads on and everything, yeah, leather. Just straps. lining it up better, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, I have a big forearm. It gets in the way. Wow, I mean? big oh, wow. <laughs> is that what it is? Yeah. Okay, dude. You know what? You know where I went the other day. So I, I've never done this before. Um, so you know, I have two kids already, right? My youngest is ten. I never did the the full anatomy scan uh, ultrasound. Um, oh, that's a little weird to me. It what is. What did you think? Did so, you, you're such a softie. I feel like you'd get all mushy. Oh, about it. so when we went there, I was weirded. Oh, out. Jessica got so emotional afterwards because this is her first. You know, oh yeah, her yeah. first baby, and th apparently this is a common fear that some women will have, where they're before they feel the baby, they'll be like, "Is there even a baby in there? Mm. Oh my gosh, what's going on?" Of course. So we did the full anatomy scan, and then after when she saw the baby in there moving, you can see the arms and legs and everything. Oh, it makes it way more. Oh, real. dude, she she cried, and I hugged her, and it was so awesome. But seeing you know my kid in the womb, moving around, and then they did this three D like picture mm -hmm. of the baby's face, kind of from the side, and it kind of looked like me a little bit. I saw a little bit of my features. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? That's what's really? cool. that's what was weird to me. Really? Yeah, wow. it's a little too. Alien looking, you know, mm, yeah. like the. I mean, it's cool that we have the technology to actually do that. To so, did you tell them ahead of time that you didn't want to know the sex? Because then, yes. at what point you'd have to be like, okay, now you got to look away, right? No, so so I did. I said, you know, we both said that we want to, we don't want to know the sex. So, you know, avoid telling us or avoid showing us. Yeah, he went through, did the whole thing. I couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl. Now, was that a thing that you both? agreed on and wanted to do or one more than the other or you both were like adamant about i don't want to so i thing. originally would want to uh, would would have wanted to know i did it with both right i yep. knew with both my 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 kids but she said you know i think it would be more fun to wait for that plus we're you know we're trying to do we're, we're, we're having the baby with a midwife and so that whole process and she's like you know going through all that i think it'll it'll make it it'll drive me more knowing i get to see the sex of the baby so after she said all that, I was like, you know what? I, I like that. I like the waiting. I think that's going to be such an exciting, yeah. you know, you can know. We, can we throw you the gender reveal party? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then I'll just like get a cannon and blast off like yeah. a pink uh, yeah, dude. smoke. But yeah. I, I'll tell you what, the experience this time around is is different for me because I already have two kids. Again, like my, my youngest is 10. And, you know, ki the, the, the infant baby toddler stage, actually all the stages, but I remember these stages because my kids are still kids, but they're out of those stages. It went by so fast yeah. that now I feel like I'm going to cherish it and be way more present it's, this time it's around. It's kind of funny because that's that's what, you know, I talked to my parents about that same fact, right? Because they, they get to be grandparents to where they, they watch, you know, the kids. They, they appreciate every minute yes. of, of their time with them at, like, certain stages. And they keep trying to, like, tell me about that as I was going through it. And it's – I could totally see that if, if it was later on now where, you know, I had another one. Oh, yeah, dude, yeah I think a lot of that's just being older and wiser, right? Yeah, that's part of it. Because I, I went into this being like that. Like, that that's important to me to be a part of every mile stone and i've been videoing and logging everything that he's doing because and i know it goes i mean everyone says it goes so fast well don't you see like your son now is he's getting close to one right yeah 
do you, are, do you look at pictures of your son when he was like two months old and go, whoa? Oh, yeah. No, he looks totally different. I mean, his Instagram page is, and I've done it like really systematically so you can really see like a, a consistent progression. So I do about six to seven uh, videos and pictures of him between each one of his month checkups. Mm -hmm. So basically once to twice a week, I, I'm posting something of that time frame of his life. And then, then I do the you know eight month, the nine month, the ten month mm -hmm. photo of him. Mm -hmm. So when you go through his page, it's like a perfect timeline of that. So it's wild to go back and already do that. So that's cool. But I think that's so neat though that we have. I mean, that's so cool yeah. that he's gonna have that when he gets older that he can go back and kind of like scroll through all that. Totally. That'd be wild to see yourself. Totally. Like that. And I hate yeah. to admit this, but it is true. Um, I'm I'm probably gonna be a better father this time around. I'm not saying I was a bad father before. I was just young. Yeah. Now that I'm older and I went through it, uh, I, I know I'm way more patient, that's for sure. And I know how to control the the insecurity urges that I think a lot of dads get, right? When you get a baby, your instinct is like work all the time, need to provide, need to be fine. Uh, yeah. And you know, as I'm older, I'm realizing, okay, I also need to prioritize time spent with the family. Well, you're a lot more established too. And now you're you're so self aware. So, you know, are there specific things, and your kids both turned out amazing. Like you obviously hit a home run with both of them. So even though you're picking yourself apart, that you'll be a better father. Are there even actionable things that you can think of right now that you're like, you know, I could have done this better with my son or I could have done this better with my daughter. I'm going to make sure I do that. Can you even think of anything? Like oh, that? yeah, absolutely. Um, number one, um, so in my early days as a father, you know, I valued being there for moments. Uh, they're doing a play or they're playing a game or, um, you know, they, they get an award at school. I was at every single one of those, but I was not super present on the day to day making lunch and breakfast and, you know, helping them with homework and, and that kind of stuff. I just, I just worked a lot. Right now that, you know, especially after I got divorced and my kids were with me half time, I do, I do a lot more of that now. And I realize how important those things that you don't think are a big deal are because you're actually a part of their life. You're you're really a part of their life when you do all that. So I'm going to be way more involved uh, on in everything uh, versus how I was with my kids. The other one is 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 temper. I was way less patient uh, as a younger father, more likely to to lose my temper and get frustrated. And now it's just and it's funny. I see it with my parents. Like I see like especially when my kids were little and my parents would would babysit them. They would do shit to my. They would say shit to my dad or my mom, and I. I think to myself like, I would. I would not be here today if I'd said that to my parents. How did they get so patient? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I can't even believe it. I remember one time I. I think my son threw his food at my dad's face, and my dad laughed. I was like, "Whoa, who is this man? <laughs> if I did that, it would, this would have been backhand." Yeah, now, you know? Justin, are you? Uh, so, you and Courtney, do you think that there's like certain? things that like she just kind of owns with the kids and then certain things that you kind of because that's one of the things I'm going through right now is obviously Max is still really young mm -hmm. and I'm starting to pick up on things that like you know I take the lead more on or she takes more lead are there are there very distinct things in your relationship that she kind of handles all the time and then you always handle yeah um and I and I think we've we've learned that together, like what our strengths and, and weaknesses might be and where to step in and where to help. And like, I'm always just looking at where I could be most effective and, and, you know, help in terms of like, uh, helping them to develop, to be more better behaved and more examples of, of better humans and, and that I can, but, uh, mainly it's, um, typical, I mean, it's kind of almost like fifties esque, you know, typical kind of stuff where, uh, like she doesn't like a lot of the disciplining she she'll do it but like um, has a different way of doing it and then um, I leans a little bit harder on me to to be a little more stern uh, and to to have them experience things themselves and really teach themselves more than intervening so we kind of go back and forth with that but she she less she she knows that like uh, her per, she has more of a propensity to kind of intervene and get involved and try and like, like help help yes yeah, she, mm. she's a big helper like that's I mean she's a nurse so it's like she just she's she just oozes empathy it's just like uh, you know something I love about her uh, but but also it's like I'm I I try to use moments as as like uh, teaching moments um, when they occur and I try to make examples and then try and then it's taken a while to build 
uh, the kind of relationship where we know like, okay, if I'm taking this lead and I'm going in this direction that you're going to back and support me in this and there's no division in it. Um, and so we've, you know, we've kind of worked all that out. Um, I, I teach them, you know, how to be more helpful to help her and like to contribute and clean and do, uh, you know, all these things around the house and, and be an active member of the family. Uh, and so like responsibilities and, uh, you know, self-sufficiency. And, um, so th- I mean, uh, that, that's a lot of what I'm kind of implementing did, with my now, kids. Did you, did you have to, did that take years to iron out for you guys? Because I, I feel like that's going to be one of the challenges that Katrina and I have like Courtney, uh, Katrina, you know, bleeds empathy and, you know, it, and, and again, like you said, I love that about her. Like I, I can rely on her to be, the, I'm like almost e- uh, emotionless, you know, I'm terrible when it comes to that. So mm-hmm. we, we make a great balance in a team. Uh, but because of that, I'm probably the one who's going to be more likely to push him, make him, you know, allow him to fail and get up on his own, you know, at where she would be more to come, swoop in and help or rescue was there, uh, you know, a rough patch at the beginning with you guys, and then you eventually kind of saw eye to eye on that? Or? Yeah, there was moments where I would uh, have a tone in that she didn't like the tone of, of voice that I would use uh, with the kids, and always felt like I was a, a little bit too, uh, uh, you, you know, commanding and and, and too authoritative, uh, and so I had, and that was hard for me because I. Th- I, in my opinion, in my uh, experience, that's how I responded well, you know, to my parents and like, like I needed that sometimes to shake my train of thought. Uh, and, uh, to, to her, it was like, oh, I can't believe you're, you know, you're so hard on them all the time. And so, and, and so we'd fight back and forth. Well, I'm doing it for a reason and they, you know, yeah. they need to be tougher about this. And, um, and so I've, I've learned to, to lessen more uh when she subtly points it out now uh to where like i really do listen when when my voice starts to get to a level where i've I've been just constantly barking at uh orders out there and like so i've i've learned how to calm that down and she's she knows how to weave through that without getting me upset or i know now how to how to check them without getting her upset uh, it, it, you know, and so it's taking time, dude. It's the 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 you know mom and dad roles are, are both super important. I I watched a um a TED talk. There was this lawyer, this this woman lawyer who was talking about how fathers um are so poorly represented in um like child custody battles and and, and stuff like that. And she said that some of the questions that they'll ask the fathers. Uh, to test how much you know about your kids whenever they're going, because she said nine out of ten times, if they, if they fight over custody, the dad's going to end up with every other weekend, you know, type of thing. If, uh-huh. if the mom really pushes it or whatever, and she said one of the things that they do is they'll ask the father questions like, um, you know, you know, what's the kid's teacher's name? You know, at what time is their their doctor appointment? What's their doctor's name? Stuff like that. Mm. And the dads would be like, fail. Yeah, I don't oh, know. Yeah. And she said, <laughs> and she said, and so the way I would defend them is I'd get up there. And then I'd ask him questions like this. If your kid could have any superpower, what would it be? What is your kid most afraid of at night when they're scared? Mm -hmm. And she said, fathers and mothers typically know different things about their kids. And when she would ask those kinds of questions, the dads knew right away. Oh, Oh. I know what they're scared of. What an awesome experiment. Bro, I watched this this TED Talk. That's great. The TED Talk made me emotional watching in the beginning because she's really talking about the value of a father – um, and I think a lot of times as, as, as dads, we're told that we're not, sometimes we're told we're not as important. Um, and, and, you know, I get where some of that comes from. A lot of, there's a lot of men that just don't, aren't involved. Um, but for those of us that are involved, you know, it could be a little hurtful because I mean, we are mm-hmm. very important as well. It was, it was a really powerful, you know, really, really powerful video. Anyway, did you guys see that uh, Magic Spoon changed their formulation a little bit? Again? Yeah, uh, no. So there's some, there was a little bit of confusion around, they changed some of the fats that they're that are in their product okay and i asked max uh lugavir about this you know max is the, the dude is we, i love the guy i love how he well it's also who introduced the brand to us yeah and i love how he talks about nutrition or whatever so they went with um a a type of oil i think it was sunflower oil mm-hmm. uh, and a lot of people were upset about that mm. and so i told him i said isn't that a bad oil and he says no they use uh high oleic uh oil which is healthy for you. It's got um, lots of monounsaturated fats. It's very chemically stable. 
Um, and they also said it, he said it makes it taste better, which is why uh, why they did this. So they're they're constantly changing the formulation, keeping it healthy, but trying to always improve its taste because I can only imagine how difficult it is to make a cereal that oh my on its own has. I, I'm amazed grams of protein. Is what, uh, at what they've done. And I've, I have tasted the difference every time they roll out a new formulation, and it has been improved substantially. Each one of the flavors has improved uh, dramatically. Uh, it's funny because I, I saw something. I don't remember where I saw this, but I guess, um, you know, we always talk about blueberries being the, you know, the best flavor, and I'm, like, always trying to make sure that we're stocked up with the blueberry and all this. And I guess there's this other podcast out there with uh, Chris Jericho. Remember Remember the old uh, wrestler? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Chris Jericho. Yeah, that's right. He's, he's trying to say that he's going to buy out all the, the blueberries so he could stockpile it himself. Oh, no. And so, yeah, dude. No, I'm coming for you, Chris Jericho. Yeah, don't challenge Justin to a Oh, a I'll, I'll eat you out of, the, out of the house. Yeah, I'm glad you finished that sentence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 I will eat some. Oh, my God. Yeah, <laughs> that, could, that could have gone horribly wrong, bro. I, I'm a hey, Mr. Jericho. You don't want to challenge Justin to a cereal <laughs> competition. Okay? Yeah, that's the last thing you want. You're to going do. to lose. Yeah, you're, you're not going to win that at yeah. all. You know yeah, what I mean? I'll put you in a, in a position, dude. So uh, UCLA just got a ton of funding to study uh, terpenes and their effects on the body. You guys know what terpenes are? Yeah, part of the weed. Yeah, well, what makes it taste a certain way? Right. So terpenes are found in lots of different uh, plants, right? Terpenes like um, one is called limonelle, I think it's called. You find that in lemons, so it gives it that lemony smell or whatever. Um, pine has a particular type of uh, of terpene that gives that pine smell. It's, it's just the oils that the plant releases. Correct? Yes, and what they what they're finding because they got, again they got funding for this. I forgot how much money they got, but they got it quite a bit. What they're trying to find is why, because now studies are showing that terpenes in combination with cannabinoids or even by themselves have uh, effects on the body. In fact, I read the article and it said that, because there's always a speculation in, in terms of cannabis, right? There's like sativas and indicas and, oh, sativas give you more energy. Indicas relax you a little more. A little more sativas might make you more anxious. But then if you have a sativa and an indica that are identical in their cannabinoid profile, Sometimes you still will get like these reports of different effects. Hmm. And they're saying now it probably might have more to do with the terpenes that are in there. Well, I remember when we uh, were doing work with Dosis and we interviewed, uh, I forget his name, but the CEO, right? Mm -hmm. Dosis. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a while ago, a few years ago. And they were the first company that I known that were really manipulating all that because they were starting to connect the dots that it actually had more to do with how we felt uh, afterwards. Uh, than than what everyone else had said before. Because yeah. up until that point, it's always been about CBD, THC. What are the percentages and the levels? Is it more indica? Is it more sativa? Is it a hybrid? And that was all we really talked about. But it sounds like there's more and more research coming out that the terpenes have a major impact on that. Yeah. So we may find either medicines or treatments in the future hmm. that may be just terpenes. You know what I mean? Where yeah. you inhale a vape or which makes sense to someone like me who's been smoking weed for quite some time. And, you know, the, you have these these moments where, you know, I, and, and I'm sure anybody who has uh, that can relate is, you know, sometimes you get a strain and you're like, wow, that just felt amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and you just love it, you know, and then you, you tie it to the name, you know, like, oh, it must be that purple kush was so amazing. Yeah, and it's like right. it probably is a lot more going on that you just got this this perfect combination and then it, it paired really well with your body. Yeah, sometimes you're super paranoid or like you're amped or like right. a little sleepy. The, uh, the, the names, dude. Stoners are funny <laughs> with the way they name. <laughs> I know. Plant, you know? It's like Girl Scout cookies, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, Fruit Loop cereal. Did, uh, are there any strains? Bubonic that, pr uh, chronic. Yeah, did, yeah. You, did you ever, was there any strains in particular that you found that just didn't work for you, Adam? Like is our strain and like you know like uh, I don't like that one. Well, some some really heavy pur purples don't, I don't do really well with because they'll just make me really tired and I mean it'd be, it'd be it's great if I was trying to have it before bed, but you know for the most part I, everything works pretty damn well with me. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I like them all for all the different reasons because there's certain things that open up this creativity side of me. There's certain strains that uh, give me energy and like I, I could almost go even though I don't uh, like working out on it, but I could because. Um, I get energy actually from it. There's other ones that kind of make me in a, you know, laughy kind of giggly. Enjoy watching a Netflix show or what, like you knuckleheads watching cartoons, like yeah. you know that type of stuff. Like so, I, there's never been a strain that I've had, and I was like, 
Like I know you have it's White Widow for you, right? Do you remember so, that? Yeah, yeah, I do remember oh, that because I I actually like whites. I oh. like White Rhino, White Widow. I like those strains. Um, but I remember the first time that you shared that that you had, and I, you know I would challenge you that it might have been just a bad experience, and so you're like written it off. No, I've you. had <laughs> so I've had White Widow um, three times, and each time. It's giving me now. I don't know if it's because the first time was so bad that I'm anticipating right, right. what's going on. But I told you guys, I literally this has never happened to me on cannabis. I thought that the FBI was outside of my place <laughs> and that they were trapping the sewers. Stealth choppers, and it, so I couldn't flush my weed down the toilet. And I thought for sure, and they were on the roof. I felt like they're on the roof. And I you're like thirty things. something years old. Oh, I was a, I was an adult. I was like thirty years old. Totally, Dude. totally. Freaking out! You're the only two weed nerds I've ever met that have can like explain differences between strains and all. That. Like all my friends would just look, dude, smoke a bowl. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was the extent of my knowledge. Well, of for marijuana. me, I mean, that's really the the listeners that that don't go all the way back to the beginning. It's actually, well, I mean, if it wasn't for that, mind pump may have never happened because what originally connected Sal and I was I had never met a fitness person, uh, someone who is really passionate about health and fitness, and then also well-versed in marijuana. Just at that time, it wasn't popular. And we're talking six, seven years ago. And I was in the midst of you know running the cannabis club. So I was in the thick, and th- thick of it. And then going into it, I knew nothing. So I mean, I remember the first day that I took the opportunity to, to run these facilities, I went straight down to Barnes & Noble, bought a stack of you know uh, books and started reading. And became fascinated. Uh, I started to, to learn all the parallels that the plant had with, with the human body and the way it's fed. And I'm like, oh, I just started, I geeked out and just started going deeper and deeper into it. And I remember when Sal and I first started talking on Facebook, uh, most of what we first shared before we shared any fitness information was strains that we liked or what we the had science. tried. science. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that was really what connected us uh, originally. And that was like, I was like so enthralled that I was like, oh my God, there's another fitness dork that is also yeah. a weed dork. Like well, I didn't even know that existed. <laughs> well, it's yeah. so funny. It reminds me of uh, when I talk to people who are really into wine, you know, the sommelier kind of a thing. I wonder if there's like a job for a person like that in the weed uh, oh there is direction, right? you know absolutely there i mean they bud tenders and i forget what the, the the more formal name is for them but it's a lot like that it's very similar to that and there's a lot of companies now uh in fact i have a, a friend uh, a friend of a friend uh, ryan who is actually has created one of these companies where they actually do uh food and wine pairing with the different strains so you'll have a strain you'll take like two puffs of it then they'll, you'll eat mm. something and then you'll go to the next next uh, course and then you'll have that and so hmm. yeah no there's definitely people that uh you know have are b- broke it down to that level where they pair it with certain experiences dude it's there's one strain has a special place uh, for me jack herrera that's a it's a considered an heirloom strain right it's one of the first like strains that started that they started you know breeding with other strains that one uh has a special place for me because that's the one that i had when I came up and created uh, Maps Anabolic the first time, I was up <sighs> all, till four o'clock in the morning creating this program, and I was on. So that one's always got a you know a special place for me, dude. I gotta tell you guys, uh, I have to uh, make an admission. I got bamboozled recently. What? Yeah, you I got, got hoodwinked on a I, on like it's not like a ant powder. No, 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 not a supplement. <laughs> no more ant powder. Not a sub. I don't want to talk too much about stuff you know about what's going on because again we're 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 trying to make the point that actions are louder than words. Yeah. But I got bamboozled, and I want to share this because this is happening a lot right now. So I saw a, there was a tweet that's been shared by people. They, they screenshot it and send it to each other. And in the tweet, it said, it's like Antifa, and it says, like, we're going to be – I'm going to paraphrase, but we're going to be going into suburban neighborhoods next and, and you know robbing – you know, suburban homes or whatever. So, of course, everybody freaked out. Like, if you're reading that and you're- Oh, that one got me, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, and it did for me, too. I got heightened up because yeah. I'm thinking- what like, you're going Oh, to, wait a minute. You're going to neighborhoods? Like, this is becoming crazy, right? So, I got a little heated. I got emotional. I started to feel myself get a little bit whatever. And so, when I calmed down, I did some research. And it turns out that that tweet was put out by a far-right white supremacist group Dear and what God. they're trying to do is they're trying to use fear to manipulate the other side. Yeah. And then I read an article, and this has been happening for a long time, and, I, and it's important that we communicate this because, my, this, by the way, this has been happening since the Cold War, right? Since the Cold War, countries have messed with each other mm-hmm. and tried to cause 
unrest and division. America's even done it. Our CIA has done it many, many times, right? Yep. But today we have social media, which is just, it's accessible to many, many individuals. It's almost impossible to control. Ever since social media became popular, it's been ramped up. We know that the, the Russians were investigated for their how they they affected the election, mm-hmm. and it turns out you know Rush, Trump wasn't working with them, but they still were trying to affect the election. L- just to- look at all the psyops uh, protocol. Yes, like, just look into that. Is all I have to say about that, and it's very interesting uh to see that uh, and again like you're right it's been like every country has you know this type of uh you know division where they they all they manage that they try to create this this civil unrest amongst you know one of their uh, competing countries or enemy countries that's how you weaken them right so how do you go to how do you weaken a country without going to war with them which is expensive and deadly and if if both countries have nukes nobody wins so they do this psychological warfare and it's well documented this isn't me making something up and so be aware because a lot of the the tweet all the, the really scary tweets and memes and shit that you're like well, I can't believe this is happening yeah many times those are other countries or nefarious organizations whose goals are not to get one side to win or another side to win their goals are simply and purely to create unrest and division and you know I want to make this statement and I want to make it very clear it's the vast majority of, of Americans are good people. Most mm-hmm. of us. Yes. Most of us are good people. Most of us want the same things. We want safety. We want freedom. We want to, you know, uh, take care of our kids. We want to have opportunities. We want to be friends with people. We don't want to be afraid. Um, that's most people. And it doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. what, you know if you're a police or whatever. And there's more of us than there are of bad people. But a lot of this stuff that's coming through social media, and by the way, one of the most powerful methods of manipulation, and again, you can read how they do this. This is, again, this is not, um, I'm not making this up, is to take a real issue and inflame it. So they're not going to make up an issue. Right. They're going to take a real issue that people are already like angry about, mm-hmm. and then they'll fuel the shit out of it. And so I th- what we're seeing is a lot of that, and 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 you're seeing that a lot, and so you have a lot of anger, mm-hmm. and then they come in, and then they push it's justified to anger, violence, and to create, and then yeah, and then it gets used in other directions, which you hijacked. Know, it's just, yeah, it's just oh my god, it's so frustrating. It gets to see. To- totally hijacked. I, I've I've see, I saw a video. I've seen videos now where where there's protesters and they're angry and they're chanting, and then some random people show up and start the riot. They'll throw the match or they'll break a window and then mm-hmm. they'll disappear and get people kind of They've into- used movie clips, uh, you know, and some uh, I, that I've seen in terms of like- Oh, uh, showing- Where they've shown riots and the different things from like other instances or movies yeah. like and, and use that to fuel more enragement amongst everybody. Yeah, we need to, we need to all just, you know, uh, there, there are definitely ways to change things by working together through peace and remember- there are more good people than bad, and, and we just need to remember that, stick together, and uh, try to control. Because when, yeah. when, you, when your emotions are running high and you feel hate yeah. and you feel f- fear, you are the easiest to manipulate. That's, that's rule number one. They wanna mani- you want to manipulate someone, make them feel scared and angry, and then you can twist them and get them to do kind of whatever you want. First question is from Mrs. Lift to Hunt. Why do I struggle to put weight on my squat? I am a long, lanky build and have tried different stances and cannot break 300. That's a that's a really good question. There's a lot of reasons why... It's not fair. Yeah. Us tall people have a disadvantage. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's true. true. There, there's a lot of work p- harder. potential reasons why your weight might not, not be going up. So I'm going to talk about the most common ones. One of them is, is your workout programming might need to change. You might be doing the same stuff over and over again. It's not working... Uh, maybe you're doing too much or too little. Maybe you're stuck in a rep range. So move things around a little bit. The second uh, most common reason is, believe it or not, lack of stability and mobility. That will oftentimes prevent you, especially if you're lifting decent weight, you're squatting 300 pounds. Mm-hmm. So I know that you at least know something about squatting. I mean, that's not that's not nothing. 300 pound squat is pretty significant. So that tells me you know how to squat. You've been pushing yourself. What might be preventing you from moving up is that your body... Doesn't your body senses instability? It senses uh, lack of mobility, and it just won't allow you to get stronger. I mean, I, I'll I'll, t- I'll give you uh, I'll mm-hmm. tell you a story. I had a client once that hired me, who was experienced. The dude was pretty built. 
Uh, we would have conversations at the gym. I must have impressed him because he decided to hire me. And I was at the time I was a younger trainer. I remember thinking like, "Whoa, this big dude is going to hire me. That's pretty cool." And his main goal was to get his bench press higher. Now his bench press was, I don't remember what number it was stuck at, but it was significant. It was like 350 or 360 pounds, something like that. And so I remember talking with uh, one of my other trainers who was really experienced. And he, and I said, what should I do? And we talked about programming. And he said, try working on his shoulder stability. So oftentimes that's the problem. So he came and saw me and I did very basic uh, shoulder mobility movements, rotator cuff exercises and shoulder mobility stuff. And within a couple weeks, he added like five or 10 pounds to his bench press that he'd been stuck at forever. Mm -hmm. And it was all because his body was more stable. So he was able to exert more force. So if you're not doing regular mobility work, um, that could make a huge difference. There, there is also the possibility nutritionally. So, um, and th this happens to me a lot when, um, you know, when you, when you get back you, and when you get into training and if you're, di especially if you're dieting uh, to lean out, or lose body fat, and then you're also wanting to increase your squat strength. That's hard to do. You know, at, at one point, your body adapts and gets as strong as it's going to get for the amount of muscle that you have on your body. You've you've got to a point where you're getting you're generating as much output as you can for that, and you literally need to build more muscle to get stronger. And if you're not feeding the body enough nutrients to build more muscle, it's really tough. And that's not to say that somebody can't be in a calorie deficit or following ma maintenance calories and see strength gains. And I would always go to my programming first, but if you've done a really good job, let's say you like you work and cycle through the maps programming, which we know what that looks like. And you're still struggling with putting on uh, weight on the bar for your squat. The other thing I'd ask you is to uh, look towards your nutrition and have you gone on like a mini bulk and actually tried to increase calories. Uh, and this is very common for a lot of my female clients, you know, it's, it's, uh, was always really difficult for me to get a client to, that, that was female to, Hey, let's, let's increase calories and put some weight on, you know, most of them come to me and be like, Adam, I want to lean out, yeah, I want to lose true. weight. And they, they're always eating around, you know, 1500 calories. And I'm like, Hey, let's, let's boost you up to 2000 and really push the strength component. Um, so I would actually look there too. So if you haven't looked at the programming, I'd look there first, then the next place I would look is actually my nutrition and and actually try putting yourself on like a two-week calorie surplus and watch what happens to yeah. your squat. Now, Justin, you have a really good squat. Are there Thanks. complementary exercises that you that you have found that contribute to your squat more or than nutrition, others? nutrition, like cheese. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, too, for me, it's changing up the protocol and changing up the acute variables. Um, so a, a lot of times, if I'm not as connected – in my squat, I'll do pause squats. Uh, if, if, if the problem for me is digging myself out of the hole. So if I'm at the bottom part of my squat and I'm having a hard time digging my way back up, uh, that's going to be a focus of mine. And so uh, sometimes I break it up uh, almost like a power lifter where I'm looking at, uh, you know, the different parts of the lift and where I can improve uh, those specific parts of the lift. Um, so that would be pause squats would be one of them for me, uh, but also just taking the time to then change it up and, and focus on unilateral training. Uh, mm, that's, that's something right. that I, I tend to do when I have when I'm in a rut. Uh, in terms of like progressing on my squat, I, I take that as an opportunity to then do what you mentioned in terms of mobility wise, but also apply exercises in that directions where I'm in a split stance. I'm, you know, doing lunges, I'm doing Bulgarian split squats, I'm doing unilateral type exercises, uh, to then really regain that, that, that stability, uh, you know, uh, to, to then go up and apply to, to my back squats. Next question is from Cure Steve 7 As someone who has gone to a big box gym for years, I have struggled during this quarantine. I am probably used to doing way too many isolation movements, but at present only have a barbell, weights, and a squat rack. Can I solely use this equipment and still make progress by focusing just on compound movements? You'll probably make more yeah. progress if you do that. I mean, I remember that was one of the greatest shifts in my own personal physique is when I uh, stopped training all – I mean, I was notorious for coming to the gym and doing two or three machine exercises to warm me up. You know, it was like leg extensions, leg press, you know, chest fly, pec deck. Mm -hmm. Like, I would do all these machine stuff. In fact, there would be many workouts where I may not even hit dumbbells or barbells. 
And uh, one of the single best things I ever did was switch over to, to purely barbell training and with a little bit of dumbbell training to complement that. And one of the cool things about once you, once you commit to that and you make that switch, and what I love about that now is I do way less to keep the physique that I used to bust my ass in the gym for an hour and a half doing 15 to 20 different exercises. Mm-hmm. I can go in the gym now and literally do four or five exercises, maintain the physique that I like to maintain and with it, with half the effort because of the, the choice of exercises that I'm doing. So, man, uh, I, I think it will greatly benefit you if you discipline yourself to uh, do that. Free mm-hmm. weights are superior. And I'm not saying you, you, you shouldn't do machines. I'm not saying... But if you had to pick free weights, crush machines for a few different reasons. Number one, when you get in a machine, your body has to follow the machine. Mm-hmm. You have to follow the range of motion of the machine, the path of movement. You have to follow the machine itself. Free weights always follow your body. It doesn't matter if you're tall, short, how you move. It doesn't matter. The free weights follow your body. The second thing is that the, ver- the variety with, with free weights is insane. It's absolutely insane. I can do. I can train my entire body with uh, more exercises than I'll do, than I can use with just a pair of dumbbells, a barbell, a squat rack, and adjustable bench. I worked out. By the way, this is how I've worked out for the last um, I don't know 15 years, almost exclusively, and I've made the best progress and strength gains and muscle gains in that period of time. This is how bodybuilders trained for the most part uh, until probably the 80s. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the first fitness books I ever got was uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding and the vast majority of exercises per body part in that, and I had the original one, which is the older one, were all these dumbbell and barbell movements that you could do for the body. And that's just how I learned. Now, when I trained clients, I found it to be the same way. When I got clients to be, do really well with free weights, it it would trump uh, you know, 12 machines combined in terms of progress. So you're actually in a far better position. In fact, the fact that you're forced to rely on free weights mm-hmm. is a blessing in disguise. Right now, you may be thinking to yourself, oh, I don't have so much machines and this might suck. Watch what happens yeah, to your the, body. Yeah, the new stimulus that now your body's going to respond to, just watch uh, what that does uh, to your muscle development. I mean, it's it just, just changing something up like that. If you're used to just uh, moving only in a track and, and using these machines to really – uh, placing you in position without stabilizing, without uh, you know actively controlling your body, embracing uh, it's a completely different experience, and uh, your body's going to respond accordingly, which may be amazing for you. Well, this is also part of the reason why CrossFit exploded. Yeah. Oh, they I mean, had the best exercises. They did. Yeah. They did. That's what they did a great job of, and so you know, and a lot of people got results, and that's what turned other people onto it was. You know, we grew up in a time, uh, you know, 20 years ago when I first got into fitness, um, barbell training had fallen out of favor. Uh, Deadlifting and squatting was very foreign. Yeah, you saw some people doing uh, bent over rows every once in a while, but you never saw the squat rack uh, busy. You never saw someone deadlifting uh, at a 24-hour fitness. Ever. Ever. Never. Yeah, yeah. Never, 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 never. So. You know, it was it was literally. I mean, even as a trainer, I I made the mistake of like categorizing those uh, exercises as like a power lifter. You know, I'm not a power lifter. I don't train those mm-hmm. exercises. So it wasn't until CrossFit did that become very popular. So it was something they did really, really good. Was they they implemented some of the best movements in their training. Now, luckily for me, I learned these movements from again these old muscle building books, and you know there was a group of power lifters that had a strong influence on me when I was a kid. And no joke, I was a general manager of a gym after having been a, a trainer and trained clients, and I would deadlift in the gym, and almost almost every time, a member would come up to me. And say, oh, what are you doing? You're, yeah, you're going to hurt yourself. Uh, yeah, you shouldn't lift it that way. And I'm like, I'm doing a deadlift. And they're like, a what? Like, nobody did it. In fact, nobody did let deadlift so often that the plates that the gyms had were the hexagonal plates, which yeah. you know are terrible the, for the deadlifts. The worst, yeah. Yeah, because it misplaces the, you know, to put the bar down, it shifts or whatever, because nobody ever did them. I, you know, I'd manage 30, 40,000 square foot gyms, and you'd have one squat rack, maybe. Maybe you'd have one squat rack. Uh, now, fast forward. People are now squatting and deadlifting and overhead pressing way more than they ever did. Why? Because it just yeah. crushes everything else in terms of uh, of results. So yeah. I firmly believe most people's routines should be 
over 90% free weights and then maybe 10, 5 or 10% machines or less. Well, now we have squat racks we can easily fold out from your wall. I mean, where's your excuse now? Exactly. Next question is from Harry the K32. What is your opinion on false grip versus standard grip while overhead pressing or barbell benching? I feel as though I have more strength using a false grip. Yeah, so the false grip is when your thumb is not around the bar, right? It's on the same side as your fingers. What do they call it? Monkey, Monkey grip or whatever? Grip is what I call it, yeah. Okay, and it is true that if you, especially if you practice that way, you're going to feel more stable while you're pressing. So you might want to ask yourself, well, why? Why do I feel more press, uh, more more stable? It's because your the, the the placement of the bar on your palm actually shortens the lever a little bit. If you take a full grip, mm. the the bar tends to be a little bit further, just a little bit further away from the wrist. It feels like a longer lever, so it feels a little bit less stable. Um, so I can see why people like to press this way. Well, here's, all, you're also resting on the joint and not having to yeah. stabilize the forearms. Yeah. Now yeah. here's the problem with that. It's way more dangerous. I've seen too many people drop a bar on their bodies that way, and you're also strengthening a strange recruitment pattern by that, that's holding my the that biggest way. problem with it because now I, I go to use that grip in everyday life and pick things up like you're using your thumb yeah. for all those things why wouldn't i train and reinforce that same grip uh with what i'm doing in the gym uh you know this is useless to me outside the gym yeah yeah absolutely i, I believe the same way so i used to press that way for a long time and because i see vi you know pictures of bodybuilders doing it and occasionally i'll even do it now just for fun but I retrain myself to feel stable and comfortable with the full grip because it's more functional, more stable. And like Justin said, you want to your thumb is a very, very important part of your grip, and so you want to strengthen that as well. If you want to have strong hands, strong wrists, the there, if you look at your thumb, there's that meaty part of your palm. That's a muscle. Yeah. You want to get that strong. That's important to keep strong. It helps stabilize your wrist. Of course, gives you a better grip and can prevent things like carpal tunnel and, and stuff like that. False grips change also a little bit. This is splitting hairs, but it's interesting. False grips also change the recruitment patterns up in the shoulder, they found. Just like wearing wrist straps, you start mm -hmm. to change that recruitment pattern. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that important? Again, like Justin said, in everyday life, you're not going to use uh, a false grip as much as you're going to use a full grip. So you, it's better off training with a full grip. So I would say it's splitting hairs. Uh, I do both. Um, it, it just kind of depends on the mood. I think I tend to... Uh, default to the false grip when I'm really trying to move some big weight because it does feel more stable and, and, and easy for me. Uh, but I also still, I mean, we we were doing a heavy bench today and, and I was I had a full grip, mm -hmm. so I, I go back and forth between the uh, between the two of them. It's uh, I I think it's it's kind of a splitting the hair thing. Like if you feel comfortable doing it, you don't have any shoulder issues. It doesn't bother you anything. Uh, making a big deal about that and 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 uh, you know saying that you're going to hurt yourself or it's bad, uh, you know, there's a lot of other things that I'm probably going to pick apart in your routine uh, before I pick apart your your false grip. Did you, you ever seen someone lose a bar in a bench press because of a false grip? A false mm. grip? Yeah, yeah, and you yeah. You, you also got to keep in consideration too that the the false grip is is going to help a lot of people that don't have quite the thoracic mobility or the uh, scapula mobility and it, it, the ability to pull their shoulder blades back. So like when you do like an overhead press, in order for you to keep your your wrist in a neutral position, you have to really be able to get right. that bar yeah. back. Definitely. Um, and so the ability to kind of break the wrist and get the elbows underneath is, you know, it's cheating a little bit. And you see that even uh, my wrist or I have a false grip when I squat. Uh, when I squat, I, I've got an, an open, uh, open or false grip when I squat because I don't have the wrist and shoulder mobility uh, like I'd like to be able to get back there. So, yeah, it's an area that I can improve and, and would be better, and I agree with both of you, but um, it's definitely not at the top of the pyramid for me of things that I'm going to pick apart on somebody as a routine. Next question is from <clears throat> It's Lean. What are your best tips for gut health? Uh, rule number one, maintain good motility. Okay. What that means is you want to have at least one, uh, full bowel movement a day, if not, you know, two bowel movements a day. Now I know a lot of people listening don't have a bowel movement every day. And in fact, even That's Western crazy. medicine doctors will tell you it's perfectly normal to, to, you know, only poop every other day or once every three huh? days. Um, but really? yeah, yes, they will. And the reason why they say that is because so many people are like that, that they're like, oh, it's perfectly normal. Hmm. Now here's why it's important. 
when you're not getting rid of waste uh, on a regular basis, that can cause a situation where bacteria starts to back up and build in your small intestines. And you'll get something called SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now, we didn't know much about this not that long ago. Uh, but today we find that a majority of irritable bowel syndrome issues is due to uh, SIBO. So when they test people, so irritable bowel syndrome used to be this catch-all phrase where doctors didn't know what the hell's going on. So like, oh, you got stomach problems. We did, you know, we we did an endoscopy. We did a colonoscopy. Everything looks healthy. Can't figure out what's going on. Irritable bowel syndrome just mm. means you ever. It, it really, there's no cure. It's just here's your problem. You have a, a sensitive gut. But now when they go in and they test people with IBS or IB, you know, IBD or whatever. What they find now is that a majority of them have this bacterial overgrowth in their small intestines, and what helps prevent that from happening is good motility. So I would say, number one, eat in a way that promotes that, and if you find foods that reduce that, then maybe stay away from those. And by the way, if you're prone to diarrhea, that doesn't necessarily mean you have good motility. This is something else I learned. Oftentimes, diarrhea is also a sign of constipation because the body's getting rid of fluid but the real waste is kind of sticking and staying stuck there. Now, how do you get good motility? Uh, individually, there's going to be foods that might bother you. Stay away from those. You'll probably know what they are. Diversity. Uh, eat lots of well-cooked vegetables. This is important. If you want to improve your motility, vegetables can help, but cook them well. That makes it work even more. If you just eat a bunch of raw vegetables or not that much cooked vegetables, you might actually find more gas and, and, you know, distension and bloat. Mm. But if you boil them or cook them really well, that actually breaks them down enough to where you can eat a large amount and you have better motility. I think one of the keys to to gut health is is to first figure out what is potentially invading, right? So that normally if someone has, you know, irritable bowel syndrome or gut issues or SIBO, it's like there is something, there's something that is affecting that that you're consistently eating. And more often than not, it's the things that you gravitate towards the most in fact, D Doug, is the intuitive guide still, are we still half off on that? Yes. Okay. So the, the intuitive guide, this is, I mean, I recommend everybody does this, even if you don't have gut issues, but to eliminate um, most of the things that are most commonly, uh, you know, problems for most people that have gut issues, we show you how to kind of eliminate that and then how to also slowly introduce and then what signs that you're looking for. What right. am I trying to pay? The, and you know, I think the first step to having a healthy gut is becoming aware of how your body can express it and understanding that we're all very individualized, right? So, you know, I I may have we like let's say uh, Justin and I both uh, let's just say avocados irritate both of our guts, but his he may express it through headaches, uh, and I might have my psoriasis flare up, right? So. You, you, you can't just pair a food or pair an issue with, you know, somebody else's symptom that they see. You've got to know what you, all the different things that you could be looking for and then paying attention to when you introduce these foods into your diet, are they affecting you in any of these ways? Right. I wanted to ask you, Sal, so based off of all this, like you mentioned about SIBO, does that mean I may be full of shit? Yeah. <laughs> I know you are. Okay. No, um, SIBO comes back too. So if you're somebody that's had it before – and then you get better, and then your symptoms come back. You may have to treat the SIBO before. By the way, there are uh, antimicrobial um, herbs that are over-the-counter that studies show are just as effective as antibiotic med medications for treating SIBO. So you don't have to take antibiotics if you think you have uh, SIBO issues. But yeah, uh, good motility. Stay away from foods that you know irritate your gut. Drink be stay hydrated. That's actually, believe it or not, the number one reason why people have motility issues. They don't drink mm -hmm. enough water. Sometimes it's increasing your water intake. Um, we'll have you, you know, pooping or whatever uh, more often. Artificial sweeteners often, in my experience, cause problems uh, for people if they start to consume lots of sucralose uh, or aspartame. So you might want to, you know, stay away from those things as well. And then the common offenders that Adam was referring to are gluten, dairy. Soy, flour, nuts, um, and uh, egg whites. Those are the and legumes. I mean, I know it sounds like a lot, but those are the common offenders with gluten, dairy, and uh, and uh, nuts and soy being the most out of that category. So you can even just cut them out. And when I say cut them out, they have to be completely out, completely out of your diet. Not even have a little bit. Do that for thirty days, and then 
introduce one by itself for a week, see how you feel. If you feel good, introduce the next one for it's a tedious process. But up until now, there's nothing that has come close to being able to identify food intolerances uh, quite as effectively. Uh, check this out. Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Um, so if you love listening to the podcast, you want to see what we look like, you want to check out the studio. Check out uh, my nice white legs. Or yeah. if you want to be able to have an easily shareable version of the podcast, YouTube makes it really, really easy to send a link and for other people to experience our podcast, go to Mind Pump Podcast. Also, we break down uh, the questions individually, so you don't have to listen to the whole podcast. If you want to revisit one specific question, we've broke it all down for you. Again, that's Mind Pump Podcast. You can also reach out to us individually on Instagram. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. 